thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us. Uh, hallelujah. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Amen. Turn with me if you'd be so kind to the 14th chapter of the gospel according to our Lord and Savior, St. Matthew. Matthew chapter 14, and I want to begin reading with verse 16. I'll read uh, several passages or verses from Matthew chapter 14, beginning with verse 26. Verse 26. For the sake of context, let me back up to verse 22. And straightway Jesus constrained the disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. And Peter answered and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were come unto the ship, the wind ceased. Then they were that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. May God bless blessing be to his word, and may it be insight for our heart, our soul, our mind, and our spirit. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this, your good word. For it is the entrance of your word that gives light. Now we pray, Father, that you might speak to us, that we might see the one that is altogether lovely, in all of his majesty, splendor, and glory, Jesus the Christ. For it's in his name we pray and give thanks. Amen. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I want to continue our thoughts this morning that we began on last week uh, from this simple subject of Simon Peter, or Simon, who was also known as Peter. As I've shared with you before and as you've heard others say, we have a tendency to look at the people in the Bible through these stained glass lenses. And we see them as being these superhuman individuals that are larger than life and that we could never attain to the level of commitment uh, that they have reached in the Bible. And we fail to realize that they're just plain old ordinary folk, just like us. With, as, as James wrote, referring to Elijah, he says that Elijah was a man of like passion, just like us. They were human beings with all of their faults, all their frailties, with all of their foibles, with all of their weaknesses and limitations. But Jesus chose, and he continues to choose, to work through frail fallen, weak, apparently insignificant individuals. I took my grandchildren to see a movie yesterday, and that which, as much of it as I saw, I enjoyed it. I slept through most of it, as it is my custom. 
But it took me back to my childhood as the movie opens up, and it opens up with this little uh, cartoon. And the movie opens up, it's a plane, it's a bird, it's a frog. <laughs> and then my hero says, neither plane, bird, or evil frog. It's just little old me, underdog. <laughs> and so they made a movie out of underdog, see. And so then it goes into a ready, a real movie with real folk. Very entertaining. In the movie, this little old dog, he is captured by this mad scientist. And this mad scientist has been working on this formula, and the formula ends up being injected into little old underdog. And then he becomes this powerful, liberating force of righteousness and justice. This is a movie worth me going back to watch the part that I slept through. But just like this little old mutt in the movie and just like underdog in the cartoon, when a power overshadows us and when we are filled with a power that does not belong to us but that comes to us, then we're able to do things that we didn't think we could do. And it's not by power, it's not by might, but it's by the Spirit, says the Lord God of hosts. And it still pleases God to anoint people. And that's something we don't understand. We do not understand the anointing of God. And what the anointing is, it is the supernatural enabling of God. When God places his hand, when God touches an individual's life who might appear to be just an average old Jane or Joe, but through the anointing of God, average Jane or average Joe or average Rakim or average Kadisha becomes somebody that does things that's above average in the power of God. And we just can't seem to quite understand it. And we have a tendency to continue to t treat people in a common way. And it's hard for us to accept and to really fully appreciate the fact that it pleases God to anoint some people in a way where they do uncommon things. And they say uncommon things, and just like Jesus, we continue to look at folk and say, well, ain't that such and so and so and so, and I remember when, and who, who they think they are, and where, what are they speaking such great words? But it pleases God. And we can find ourselves sometimes just fighting with God because we just can't respect the anointing that are on people's lives. We can't respect the giftedness that God endows people with. But everyone who comes to faith in Christ receives a, a grace gift. They receive a, a special enabling and anointing to function within the body of Christ, to do things to serve God by serving the local church and by serving other folk. I had a conversation uh, on Friday with a good friend of mine, and we never could get on the same page because my words were, I do not believe that most Christians believe the Bible is the word of God. I do not believe that most Christians really believe that the Bible is the word of God. I believe that most Christians will say that they believe that the Bible is the word of God. But in a biblical sense, articulation and mental assent is not the same thing as belief. In the Bible, belief is determined by one's actions and by one's commitment. And I says, if all Christians really believe the word of God, then it would radically change how they live their lives. Therefore, it would radically change the church. We think we believe the word of God. We uh, thought about believing the word of God, but when it comes down to our actual practice, we have not convinced ourselves that this word is really true enough that we should seek to be aligning our lives up as much as we possibly can with every decision that we have to make to try to use the Bible as the grid through which we pass our decisions and thoughts so that the things we do align as much as possible to the book. So I think that we're in trouble. And I think the church is in trouble. I think the church is living in a time of deception. You know, the worst type of deception is to be deceived and don't know you're deceived. The worst type of being lost is to be lost and don't know you lost. To be headed somewhere on a trip 
be on the wrong road, not know you're on the wrong road, and continue to go full speed ahead on the wrong road. That's the worst type of lostness. And that's the type of deception that the church today is dealing with, not really understanding because we live in such close proximity to this culture that is so powerful and it is so pervasive and it is influencing every single decision that we make. And most of the decisions that we make are made based on a secular worldview rather than what the Bible has to say. And we don't even realize it. Because we become so accustomed to making decisions without really trying to say, well, what does the Bible have to say? Does the Bible speak to that issue specifically? Or does the Bible give guidance regarding that particular issue or the principles from the Bible that should be considered as I go through this process. And so I think the church is in the fight of his life for the authority of the scripture. Not as to whether or not the Charleston Gazette or the Charleston Daily Mail are going to accept the Bible as the final word of God, but as to whether or not the church, those who say they name the name of Christ, really and truly will accept the book as the final authority for all faith and practice and as and that those who say they belong to Christ are really striving to line up under this book and live the life that this book challenges us and calls us to live. Well, Peter was a man just like us, and he was struggling in his life with the authority of the Bible, the authority of the Bible that was incarnate in the person of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But it was through Peter that God gives us tremendous instruction because of Peter's inquisitive curiosity. He was always asking questions that the other apostles were thinking about, but they did not want to be perceived as being spiritually dense, so they wouldn't ask the question. Peter then would ask the question, and then Jesus would articulate a response, and when Jesus articulated the response, it was education and illumination for all of the apostles as well as for us. So just like during the time of Christ, there was a group of religious people, the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees, who thought that they were spiritual because they had the doctrine and the creeds and the theology. But just because we have the doctrine and we know the doctrine, we have the creed and we know the creed and we know the theology, it does not mean that we really and truly are spiritual. Look at Matthew chapter 15, and we're going to back up to Matthew chapter 14. In Matthew chapter 15, Jesus is approached by some religious leaders, and they ask him the question, why is it that your disciples violate the tradition of the elders. And why is it that your disciples, they wash, or they eat uh, with, with unwashed hands? Now, this was not an issue of hygiene. The disciples would wash their hands when they ate, but they did not go through this ceremonial purification that the religious leaders went through. And they washed and they washed their elbows and behind the neck. They went through all of this thinking that by going through this ritual, they were purifying themselves in a spiritual sense. So they said, we watch your disciples. They don't follow our traditions. Jesus' response to them was like a lightning bolt. Verse 3, but he answered and said unto them, why do you, you also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? Now you watch this. They said, your disciples don't follow our traditions. Jesus said that your traditions violate the word of God. So what Jesus in essence is saying to them, fellas, you're not just on the wrong base, you're not even in the right ballpark. These were the religious elite. These were the teachers of the law, those who owned the Old Testament scrolls. They were the custodians of the truth of God. But he said, your traditions violate, they cut against the very authority of the word of God. Then Jesus says to them, for God has commanded us and honor thy mother and thy father, and he that curseth father and mother, let him die the death. So now Jesus quotes from the Old Testament, from the Decalogue, from the law. He, he quotes the first commandment that deals with your relationship with individuals. The early commandments deal with your relationship with God. Thou shalt know the God before thee. Thou shalt, make, shalt not make any grain image like unto God, and so forth. But the first commandment that deals with your relationship with people is honor thy father and thy mother, 
that thy days might be long upon the earth which the Lord thy God give thee, and he that dishonors his father and mother, let him die the death. Now watch this. So Jesus says, you have established a tradition that violates the word of God. And the commandment that he chose to use was a commandment in terms of how they related to their parents. Isn't that interesting? He then went on to say, verse 5, but you say, whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, it is a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and honoreth not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus having ye made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. Now watch this. These religious leaders had established a, a custom to whereby they would say, everything that I have, I have dedicated to God. All of my material possessions, they are dedicated to God. Now, they didn't write a check out or they didn't take a bag of coins and give it to the priest at the temple. It stayed in their bank account. They just said it was dedicated to God. So then they would say to their parents, they say, well, anything that I might do to help you, it's already a gift to God, thus relieving themselves from any responsibility to help their parents. Now, in the old world, there was no Social Security. People didn't have 401ks, and they didn't have all this retirement type of plan. So if a family did not own land or livestock or real estate, then when people became elderly, they would become paupers unless their children would take care of them. Now, watch what Jesus does. He says, you guys will think y'all are so spiritual and y'all are so enlightened and y'all are the leaders of the spiritual world, but you got a silly tradition that violates the word of God, therefore, it's your attempt to nullify the word of God. Now, you stay with me on this because this is going to really open your eyes to something when you really see what Jesus says. He says in verse 6, And you honor not your father or mother, he shall be free, thus you made the command of God of none effect by your tradition. When a child is a minor, the way we honor our parents is by obeying them. We honor our parents by respecting them. That's how a child honors their parents. But when your parents become elderly, and when you become an adult, you still are obligated to honor your parents by showing them respect. But we're also obligated to honor our parents by helping them financially and materially if they need to help. It's still the truth whether we agree with it or not. It's what the Bible teaches, and that's exactly what Jesus was saying. He's saying you're trying to relieve yourself of your biblical responsibility before God to help your aging parents by putting your money over here in a place by saying, I've given it to God, but you really haven't given it to God. You want to consume it on yourself. But then look what he says. He says, you hypocrites. When you read the Bible closely, you'll find that Jesus was not as nearly as nice when he was dealing with religious people as we want to make him to be. He was always humble and tender when he was dealing with people on the thoroughfare of life, on the street corner, on Skid Row, the adulterous woman caught in the very act of adultery. He was always compassionate, but when he was dealing with religious folk, he was hard on them. He said, you hypocrites. Now, I don't know, my brothers and my sisters, if you really understand in the Old Testament world, but to call a religious person a hypocrite, that was about as great a, an, an indictment as you could bring against them. It was a, 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 an insult of, of huge proportion. He, in essence, says that you guys are a bunch of play actors. You've got a religious facade. This is a religious sham, and you're play acting when you come to church. You're play acting when you're before the people in terms of service and ministry. That ain't the real you. That's an actor. And he's talking to the religious folk, to the religious leaders. Now, they made this a public thing. When they came to him publicly and when they challenged him publicly saying, your disciples are violating the tradition of the elders, he now challenges them publicly and calls them hypocrites in public. But it doesn't get better. It gets worse. Jesus goes on to say, you hypocrites, verse 7, while the desires prophesy of you saying, these people draw nigh unto me with their mouth 
They got all the religious lingo. It's praise the Lord. It's bless his holy name. It's hallelujah. It's thank you, Jesus. They honor me with their mouth, he says. They draw nigh to me with their mouth, and they honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And he's talking about religious folk. He's talking about people who go to the synagogue, people who go to the temple, people offer their sacrifices. He's talking about religious folk. They draw nigh to me with their mouth. They honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. So he says, yes, they got the tradition and they got the ritual and they washing themselves in soap and water and they cleansing themselves thinking that some external thing is going to clean up the condition of their hearts, you see. But he says, they missed the whole point of what it means to be right with God and what it means to have a relationship with God. And there are times in the context of the church, we can become so consumed and preoccupied with the external things that we don't do anymore. We don't smoke anymore. We don't drink anymore. We don't fornicate anymore. Those things that we don't do anymore, we become so consumed with that, we think those things make us right with God. And we have thus turned our faith into a, a, a system of work and our own effort. Now we are righteous because we don't do some things that other people used to do. And other people still do. Now we shouldn't do those things. But not doing those things does not make us right with God. It just means we don't do them no more. Some people don't smoke anymore because the doctor told you to keep on smoking, you have a heart attack. And some people don't drink anymore because the doctors told them you got hypertension. Your blood pressure is almost off the scale and your brain is going to burst if you don't stop. And that's why they stop. And some people don't fornicate anymore because the husband or wife says you keep this craziness up, we're going to leave you and we up out of here. Or they develop some, contracted some sexual transmitted disease that they can't get rid of. Now they realize, I should have stopped doing this stuff a long time ago. Preach, young man, preach. It's not because we're right, because we stopped doing stuff. If our heart is really not connected with the heart of God, and we can tell whether or not our heart is connected with the heart of God based on the compassion and the sensitivity and the mercy that we have toward people. And Jesus said, you guys don't even have no compassion towards your own mama and your own daddy. And you think you're right with God. Your own mama and daddy don't have, and you have the means to help them, and you won't help them. And you wouldn't even think about helping somebody that's not related to you. This isn't me, y'all. This is Jesus talking. It gets worse. He then says, but in vain do you worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. He said, your religion is a sham. It is empty. It's void of any spiritual content. It's a bunch of noise. He says, in vain are you worshiping me. Now, he's talking to the spiritual elite in Israel. And then he says, verse 10, Jesus then calls the multitudes. He says, you guys chose to make this a public thing. It is now a public thing. He now calls the multitudes, and he says to the multitudes, verse 10, hear and understand. Now, that which goeth into the mouth defileth, that which goeth into the mouth defileth, not that which goeth in the mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out of the mouth, this defileth a man. Now, I've read this for 25 years and just read right over it and never really understood what he was saying. This is, this is absolutely powerful. Jesus calls the multitudes to him and he makes one statement and the one statement that he makes, it rebukes, it's a rebuttal to everything that the religious leaders have been teaching. He said this whole system that they have developed based on their spiritual and you're not spiritual because they're doing something you're not doing. It's all wrong. He says, not what you eat is what defiles you. It's what comes out of you that is what defiles you. And he didn't say nothing else. And he walked away and he let them wrestle with it. And they didn't really understand what he was saying. And the apostles really didn't understand what we, he was saying. And much of the church still doesn't understand what he was saying. 
But let me see if we together can understand what he was saying. Because Simon Peter helps us. Simon Peter helps us. Simon Peter knew, I don't know, I have a clue what he's talking about. And so after the multitude has gone away, verse 12, then came his disciples and said unto him, Lord, we don't think you understand. That's the spiritual elite. That's the creme de la creme. That's the Pharisees and the scribe. These people, they set the rules around here. Don't you know that they were offended by what you said? Don't you know they were ticked off by what you just said? You just embarrassed them before all of these people? Don't you know they didn't like that? That's what they said. Then came the disciples and said to him, Knowest thou not the Pharisees were offended after they heard the saying? There's no easy way sometime to tell the truth. Because people who don't want to hear the truth are going to be resentful by the truth being told. So they were angry and Jesus said, that's just too bad. Because if they want to be blind, then they have the right to be blind. But now they are blind without an excuse because I've shed light to where they now ought to be able to see. Are you following me? Some people are blind willfully. They just don't want to know the truth. Other people are blind by deception. They have been deceived so they don't really understand that they're walking in blindness. But everybody is responsible for the light that they are exposed to. And then walking out of darkness into the light once the light has shone. So Jesus says, now the light has been shown. The light has dispelled the darkness. Now people got to step into the light or stay in the darkness. He says, you guys, just let them be mad. Every plant which my heavenly father has not planted shall be rooted up, verse 13. Just let them along. They be blind, leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. So Jesus gives the people some light. Now they can choose as to whether or not they want to continue to follow in the darkness or whether they want to pursue the light. Are y'all following me? But watch what happens, though, in verse 16. Uh, verse 15. Then answered Peter, my man Peter said, wait a minute, Lord. Declare unto this this parable. We don't get it. We still in the darkness. We don't understand. And then Jesus said, do you, do not ye understand that whatsoever entereth in at the mouth, it goes into the belly, down through the esophagus, into the stomach, into the digestive tract. It is processed through. Some of it is turned into energy and calories to fuel and sustain the body. To, to generate the blood, the rest of it, the waste, is passed off. So how could that defile somebody's spirit? But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceeded evil thoughts, murderers, adulteries, fornication, thefts, false witnesses, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashing hands defileth not a man. A few years ago, my baby daughter wanted this hamster. My wife got her a hamster. And all these paraphernalia, the carousel, the cage, and all this deal. And I called the hamster Houdini. That hamster could get out of all those contraptions they would put him in. He would some kind of way get out of it. And then now we're in the house trying to find him. Where is it? We're trying to find him. So one night, Houdini got out of the cage, and we couldn't find him. And we never did find him. And to one day, I happened to be down in the basement, in a back room. And I said, you know, it's time for me to check this sump pump. I haven't checked it in a while. And I got to make sure that it's still working properly, because the rain season is about to come, and I don't want the basement to flood. So I go in the room. And I flipped the lid off of the sump pump. 
and almost fainted. Houdini had been missing for several months. And Houdini had fallen into the sump pump and had drowned. And he had died there and decayed. Now, that sump pump was defiled for some time. But because it was covered just with a little opening that he could get in, the odor was contained. But when I flipped the lid off of the sump pump, that which was on the inside of the pump around where the water was, that defilement came up out of there. And that's what Jesus was describing. He was describing the condition of the human heart. He says the human heart is defiled. Jeremiah 17, 9 says the heart is deceitful above all things. It's desperately wicked. Who can know it? So Jesus says that the human heart, the unregenerate heart, is already defiled. And he says what happens when we open our unregenerate mouth and things start to come out of our mouth, then that which has been contained on the inside where the soil is, where the decay is, where the putrefaction is taking place, it now comes out and it comes out in words, evil words and cursings, he says. It comes out in evil deeds, he says, for out of the heart proceeded evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornication, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands, that ain't going to hurt a man at all. What he was talking about is the condition of the heart, and he was saying there's nothing you can do on the outside to fix the real problem that's on the inside. So you can stop drinking, and that's good, and you won't get cirrhosis of the liver, and you can stop smoking, and that's good, and you won't get heart disease or lung cancer, and you can stop drinking, and maybe you won't have a heart attack or suffer a stroke. You can do all those things and still go right straight to hell. Because the problem isn't really what's on the outside. The outside is merely a manifestation of what's seeping out from the inside. And so what he does, he leaves them right there with it. Now how are you going to get right with God by washing your hands? When the heart is the problem. And so what he was trying to do with that was to drive them to repentance, to realize we better cry out to God. We better call out to God. We better plead to God because we can't change our own hearts. We don't even know the depth of the deception and of the degeneracy and the wickedness that lies there. We don't even know how evil we could be and that we can become given the right or the wrong circumstances or situations. Oh man, Jesus was something else, man. He ain't take no prisoners. Because he didn't want to leave religious people in the dark thinking that they were right with God just because they went to church. And just because they no longer went to the clubs. And just because they were no longer going into the pawn uh, shops or the porn shops. He wanted them to understand just because you stopped doing stuff isn't enough. Your heart got to be changed and only God can change your heart. Only God can cleanse our hearts. Can an Ethiopian change his skin color? Can a leopard change his spots? Absolutely not. Neither can we change the conditions of our heart apart from a personal relation with the living God through faith in Christ. And we owe Peter for this. Peter is the one who helps us to get this understanding because of his inquisitive curiosity. His inquisitive curiosity, he had to know and he had to understand, what are you talking about? You mean to tell me these people that we revere and that we love and that we respect, these people that seem to be spiritual and they seem to be on this high, elevated spiritual plane, you mean, Jesus, they all wrong? Yes! If they're preaching anything other than salvation by grace through faith. If they're suggesting that people can be made right with God by any other way other than faith in Christ and the enabling power of the Holy Spirit, yes. And it's the heart that needs to be changed. And when the heart is truly being transformed by the power of God, it will manifest itself. And that's how love and mercy and compassion and forgiveness for the least that are among us because we know in our sin sick decadent state we were destined to bulls out for God's judgment and we know that we're only saved by the grace of God we know that it's only Christ that saved us from ourselves so we never turn our nose up in self-righteous indignation we know that except by the grace of God we're the bump on skid row we're the prostitute on the street we're the addicted drug person except by the power 
power and the grace of Almighty God. And so the real heart that's been rejuvenated and been revived and transformed finds itself wanting to be an agent in the hand of God, trying to reach out to people to give them hope that there is hope in Christ for them. Well, one last thing, and I'm going to take my seat. Back in our text in Matthew chapter 14, not only was Peter this inquiring inquisitor, this with, with this curiosity, but he was also a risk taker. He was a risk taker. Peter understood you don't accomplish anything of any significance. You don't accomplish anything that moves anything by not taking some risk. Not being presumptuous. No, no, not, not doing stupid or silly things. Not doing something without praying about it and fasting about it and seeking wise counsel about it. But at the end of the day, to do something for God, you got to take a risk. You gotta take a risk and you can't be concerned about whether or not you are popular and you can't be concerned about whether or not you are successful in the eyes of men. Your preeminent ambition must be to please God and to hear him say, well done. Well, I read the text in your hearing. They get in this boat. He says, we're going to the side. Jesus stays back and he prays. And after he's prayed a while, the fourth watch of the night, just before the daybreak. And they're in this boat and the storm is raging and they're being tossed in the midst of the sea like a cork in the ocean. And Jesus gets up and he starts to walk across the lake and there he's walking on the water. And they know that's humanly impossible for anybody to walk on water. It was not, it, it wasn't really uh, uh, Unusual they would think that there was a ghost because they don't expect nobody to come walking on the water in the middle of the night. they would never seen that before. But Jesus walking on the water, he's not only the Lord of the land, but he's the master of the sea. So he defies gravity. Amen. And he rearranges the water's molecular structure and he turns it from a liquid into a solid. Or otherwise, he levitates himself and he walks on the water and Peter recognizes that that's not a ghost, that's Jesus. And Peter does a calculation. He says, I'm in this boat and I'm in the midst of the storm that Jesus is in the water. I'd rather be out in the water with Jesus than to be in the boat. And he said, Lord, can I come to you? Now that's, that's taking a risk, ain't it? It's taking a risk to get out of the boat that got a chance to get to the other side. The boat that has endured storms in the past, you know that it is physically possible for a boat to endure a storm and to float to the other side. But Peter defies logic. I'm amazed at what the church looks at. When we look at this text, we always rebuke Peter because he started to sink. But tell me somebody else in history other than Jesus that ever walked on water. He's in a company or two. In a leg by himself, but nobody else. Because he had the faith and he was willing to take the risk to step out of his comfort zone. And that's why some of you are going to die and you're going to die miserable. Because you're scared to take a chance. You're afraid to take a risk. Some of you wouldn't think about going back to school. Go back to school. If you flunk, you just flunk. But at least you'll learn something while you're going back. Some of you have been thinking about starting a business. Go to a class. Go to a small business class and learn about a small business. We got bankers in this church and business folks. Sit down and learn what you need to learn and then try it. And then go for it. If you feel God leading you to do it, nothing venture, nothing gain. And everybody concerned about whether or not they're popular, about whether or not they look to be successful in the eyes of men. I don't mean no disrespect to nobody. I don't lose not one minute of sleep, not one, worrying about what somebody think about me. Not one, not one, not a minute. Now I lose sleep sometimes worrying about folk that I love that's near and dear to my heart and concerned about their spiritual growth and development and praying about the condition of their lives and where they find themselves, but I ain't worrying about whether nobody like me or not. Don't have time for that. 
I'm not concerned about whether or not people think I'm successful or not. I graduated from that a long time ago. Because when I began to look at the Bible, I began to realize that almost all the prophets died in shame. And all the New Testament folk, including the family of Jesus of Nazareth, they all looked like failures in their lifetime. Peter was crucified upside down. Paul was beheaded by Nero. John the Baptist was beheaded. John the Revelator was put in a pan of boiling oil and feathered and then exiled on the Isle of Patmos. These guys weren't popular in their day and in their time, but they had a testimony. And what we got to decide, do we want a title or do we want a testimony? And most Christians are concerned about having a title, a position, a title. But at the end of the day, my beloved, the title will mean absolutely nothing. Nebuchadnezzar had a title, but Daniel had a testimony. Pharaoh had a title, but Moses had the testimony. Nero had the title. Herod had the title, the king of Israel. But John the Baptist had a testimony. Is it a title or is it a testimony? When we decide we want to have testimonies, then God can use us. And then God will use us to excite the hearts, the minds, and the imagination of folk. Nobody connects their life to somebody who's just going across the street. People can go across the street by themselves. If they're not physically incapacitated, or if they're not mentally limited, they don't need help to get across the street. But people connect their life to something that can do something larger than what they can do by themselves and they want to be a part of something significant so you got to cast a compelling vision. It stirs the juices inside of folks that say, I don't want just an ordinary life. I don't want just to be here and then be gone. I don't want just to die and have somebody stand up and say a few nice words for me. They take me to the to the graveyard, drop me in the hole, and come back to the church and eat potato salad, fried chicken, and drink iced tea and laugh about the things I did. Now, we got to want to do something from God, y'all. Well, this past week has been interesting for me because it's been nostalgic. And it's taken me all the way back 30 years to Western Institute of Technology when I was just a little engineering student. And I was infatuated with bridges. As a matter of fact, my, when I was an engineer, my emphasis was in structural steel design. And I love bridges. And when I worked for Tennessee Valley Authority, I used to help design bridges. And one of my favorite professors was Dr. Ernie Nestor. And he was one of the smartest people I've ever known. And he taught us all about the Nuremberg Gorge Bridge near my hometown. And it was being, his construction was being completed while I was a student at Tech. And he would make us go up and we watched him build the bridge and he would then give us uh, problems uh, concerning the bridge, and I studied all that stuff. I thought I forgot it all. I studied all about fatigue failure and catastrophic failure and steel design and the rolling of steel, and I thought about it. And I was watching them, it's tragic out in Minneapolis. And I said, I wonder is that the worst gonna happen to the church? In 1990, they expected that bridge. And they said, this bridge has structural defects. Uh, and so they started expecting it every two years. And they saw cracks. And they said, well, let's just fix the cracks. No one thought about, well, what caused the, the crack? When that bridge was designed, they had about 40,000 cars a day to cross that bridge. Today, 140,000 crossed it. In the engineering world, you have something called a dead load. That's the weight of the structure. That's the weight of the concrete. That's the weight of all the apparatuses. And then you have the live load, and that's the load that's created by moving vehicles. It creates a whole nother set of stresses in a structure. And so they inspected, I mean, highly qualified professional engineers, and their conclusion was, we can live with this. We can live with this. And then without warning, 
without notice. What appeared to be a mere fatigue crack became a failure. And when one structural member buckled, it created a chain reaction that ran the stresses through the entire structure, each member then being overstressed beyond what it was designed for, and the inevitable occurred. The building collapsed. I thought about that. And I thought about my own life. Because that's where it always starts. With our own personal examinations, Paul says, let every man examine himself to make sure he's in the faith. And I said, Lord, you know, I may have some fatigue cracks here. And you got to fix them. And whatever it takes to fix them, then I'll accept that pain because I don't want a catastrophic failure. I don't want a catastrophic failure. And I, and I just invite you to do the same thing. Amen. There are times that we ignore fatigue cracks in our own lives. Amen. And the foundation of our lives and the structural support of our lives. And just like that bridge in Minnesota or Minneapolis, on any given day, the right load can result in a fatigue crack become a catastrophic failure for individuals and for institutions. So as a pastor of the Grace Bible Church, I'm just inviting folk who are concerned about the church, let's come out on Wednesday night and let's pray. And let's get back to the simplicity of trying to understand this book. Asking God to be what he's called us to be. If it's two or three of us, then it's two or three. And asking God to shore us up and not allow us to ignore the fatigue defects, but allow him to work on them and fix them so we can have the structural and spiritual integrity that we need as a church to carry the load that this community needs for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ to carry. I'm a serious man, y'all. And every day for me is like a war. And those who are anywhere near me, they, they see it. There's stuff coming at me every single day. A wrong decision and I could collapse. Or the lives of people around me could be drastically influenced in a negative way. I take this thing serious. Everything about what I do, I'm serious about it. Because people's lives weigh in the balances. So silly, insignificant stuff, I don't have a whole lot of time for it. Because it's the lives of people, the lives of people that weigh in the balances. And we get windows of opportunity, just windows, to speak a word in somebody's life, to direct somebody in the direction of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they may choose to reject it. And when they choose to reject it, then we've did our part. We've tried to be a witness. We've tried to be a witness. And so I invite you to let's come together. Let's seek the Lord. And I believe God got something big to do, y'all. I believe that God is up to something. And I'm asking you to pray because some of you no longer believe that God will do something significant through your life or through the life of the church. I'm just telling you, I'm too young to give up on my vision, Amen. to give up on dreaming. Amen. I'm just too young. I'm, I just can't settle. I just, I just can't do it. Maybe in a couple of years I'll be ready to settle. But right now, I cannot settle for anything less than what I believe that God can do with us. Amen. And I just invite you to come. Let's dream a while. Let's believe God for a while. And let's be prepared to do what God calls us to do so we can do a work that will bring glory to him. That's what Peter did. And that's what we can do as well. Let's pray, shall we? Father, we bow before you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, for the words of wisdom that you've given us through the holy book and through the life of 
one of your choice servants, the Apostle Peter. And help us to have uh, inquisitive curiosity and help us to have risk-taking initiative to step out on faith and in faith to believe you. And help us, Lord, to see your good hand and your power. Lord, as we're in your presence today, there's maybe one or more here who's never come to faith in Christ. Help them to understand that apart from Jesus Christ, all of our hearts are wicked. They're evil. They're corrupt. But Jesus Christ died on the cross. and He shed his blood. He took the punishment for all of our sins. That you might grant us forgiveness. And that you might cleanse our defiled hearts. That you might renew our spirits. And that you might redeem our souls. I pray that people here today who have never come to Christ to realize that you are the answer that they are looking for. And they need you more than they need silver or gold. They need you, Jesus Christ, as their personal Savior. Open their heart today as it pleases you to save those who will trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. Every eye closed, every head bowed. Is there one here this morning? You just want to be made right with God. You want to know that your heart has been cleansed. That your sins have been forgiven. There's nothing that you have done that would cause you to be beyond the saving grace of God. God loves you. He sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die on the cross and to shed his blood for your sins. And God says, whoever calls upon my name shall be saved. All you have to do right where you are is say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Save me. Forgive me. And make me be the person you called me to be. If you prayed that prayer, just raise your hand right where you are. Let someone come and talk with you and pray with you. Doors of the church are open, and the invitation is extended. Is there one? You just want to be saved. Is there one? If not, let us prepare to serve the Lord's table. This is the first Sunday of the month, and our tradition here at the Grace Bible Church is that in our humble attempt to obey the Lord, that we remember him. And he told his disciples on the night that he was betrayed to be crucified, that as he had observed the Passover meal with them, they were to observe the Passover in remembrance of him. Remembering his love, remembering his passion, remembering his sacrificial substitutionary death. And so this is the Lord's table. This is the communion. And it's for those who by faith.